Van Gogh, irises and roses? That's right, irises and roses. Uh, in full bloom in this exhibition of just four paintings. Only having four pictures that are so similar to talk about, actually I do think stimulates more interesting thought. Yeah. Right? If there were a million pictures of trains and prostitutes and all the other things that might be in a picture, we wouldn't have that chance to really dig deep into our own resources and that's what art should trigger in you. So these things look as though they're all about nature, but I think they're about industry. Interesting. In order for these things to get to Paris, for cut flowers to get to Paris, it, they needed trains. In order for these pictures to be painted, they needed tubes of oil paint, which was a new invention. So all Correct. of these pictures depend on the 19th century industrial revolution to exist in any way. And I think they're kind of uh, camouflaging that fact. All four of these paintings were painted basically within a couple of weeks of each other in an insane asylum, right? In Saint Remy. And the flowers apparently were cut from the garden. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So these aren't the flowers that go to Paris, but I think that every time the you cut flowers, flowers. Yes. the reason they're so popular in the 19th century is because there's something new and fancy and special. Apparently, though, the deal with Van Gogh was also that he hadn't done still lives in, in, in a bit. I think he'd probably not done still lives for about a year before he hit these. You know, you imagine the guy basically sort of up, you know, holed up in a cell with actual bars. Um, there are these things to paint. And goes at him with insane, sort of like, almost literally insane gusto. Insane is a crucial word. We have to deal with the whole problem of Van Gogh's insanity. We do, we do. So what we get with Van Gogh is the agony and the ecstasy, right? And we have to sort of do permanent battle between the actual work and, you know, and the Hollywood sort of story, the Hollywood cliché. Except Hollywood, that Hollywood image already existed, and I don't think he could resist it. The question is, is it a cliché then? Van Gogh is really sort of the guy that busts through impressionism with this idea of, of art really becoming something else. Something you could cut your ear off for. Do you have a razor? Let's, let's try taking one off and see no, if it no makes thanks. us good painters. No thanks, no thanks. But let's remember something. Everyone bills these as Van Gogh's late style, right? He's almost dead, he's gonna die pretty soon he's after like this. A year. Yeah. yeah. But of course, what they really are is juvenilia, right? He's barely started as an artist. So there's this weird thing where we see him as a completely mature artist. Here's his mature work, his mature style, but we have no clue if that's true at all. He may have been on his way to something utterly different. We've got the work of someone who's barely a professional artist at that, this that's point. That's true. He's 37, he's had some group shows. His career is, you know, almost entirely posthumous. There's right? only one mode of painting for Van Gogh, especially at this stage, right? Whether it's a landscape, whether it's a portrait, whether it's a vase of flowers, Everything goes great guns, and it's essentially rendered in sort of the same way. Not a uniform way necessarily, but with the same kind got... of brio and, and, you know, determinacy and reductiveness, right? And also with the same sort of like set of clashing principles. Everything's a, everything's a big whack, right. right? Everything's a car crash in these paintings. Colliding. Well, that's a nice idea because, of course, our tendency and I think the tendency of most of the people looking at these flowers is going to be to say, oh, flowers, how it's pretty, so peaceful. You know, for once we get to see him, he's not crazy anymore, it's peaceful. But oh, I think, no. certainly in the context of his time, these were not peaceful images of flowers. They're slightly syphilitic. <laughs> We've not sort of seen through, you know, like a, like a screen of absence, frankly. You know, one of the cliches, speaking of cliches, about paint is always that it represents flesh, right? That there's this equation between well-painted pictures and, and beautiful flesh. But I think if we think of these in terms of flesh, we have diseased flesh. We've got pustules. We've got all of this sense of things being diseased. And of course, this is painted in a hospital, in a hospice. Um, so I think it's important to see that aspect of things, things coming apart. That, absolutely. Look, I mean, these are flowers uh, that are also convalescing. They're also sort of like not f beautiful, fresh flowers. You wouldn't give these to your mother. Yeah, that's right. Imagine Day, coming frankly. in and mom, you know, these, are not, these are not beautiful bouquets. You are correct in saying that they're essentially sort of falling apart. You know, likely the way he felt himself falling apart. There's a piece of easy symbolism happening there. I love the idea of syphilis, man. I know syphilis was literally and figuratively in the minds of people at this time. Oh yeah, absolutely. Insanity and syphilis go together in yeah, the 19th do. century. We've they forgotten do. that there were all these people wandering around, including Manet, you know, in the last stages of syphilis. So I think that's a nice way of giving new life to these flowers, as it were, is to recognize them as symbols of death. But that's very good. That's very good. And in terms of subject matter, very good. That's Thank you, sir. Correct. Correct. The myth of the modernist artist, which is again a cliche for us now, but wasn't in the day, is to basically be able to drive 
themes, subjects to some other sort of end, right? You know, again, to some literally quasi-religious end in this case. He risks his life for this thing. He risks his ear. He risks his reputation. Well, I like the religious idea. As soon as I see death in a European painting, I think Christ, right? That's the, that's the archetypal death, is Christ falling from Christ the cross. Cut down cut down from the right. cross in the prime of life. That whole notion of things dying is as important in, in these pictures as things living. I think that's, that's important to recognize. And look, the, here, we, here we have Christ falling from the cross. Oh, totally. No, I think in every one of these, but it, it has uh, halo-likes uh, shape to it, That's the actual good. brushwork, yeah? Hey, um, you're not blind. I well, thought, there you yeah. go, there you go. We actually look at pictures instead of just talking. How do you like that? We've got the most beautiful pictures in the world by common consensus, and we've talked about syphilis, pustules, Christ on the cross, death, disease, speeding trains. I think we've done a good job of completely contradicting everything that's normal to be said about these pictures. Amazingly, we haven't talked about money. Let's talk about money. We're probably looking at about a billion dollars worth of paintings in this room, considering the landscape of Van Gogh sold at auction last week for $63 million. We can't deny the way these things actually circulate in the world, which is largely as investment vehicles. Luckily, all four of these pictures happen to be in institutions the way they should be. Uh, and so that discussion, in a way, doesn't impinge so much. Which is lovely. It's lovely to imagine all of the, the Van Goghs in the world eventually filtering to museums, which is sort of happening already. But in the long run, all the most wonderful things in the world do end up in museums, and that's incredibly cheery. Let the billionaires have it for five years, 10 years, 20 years. Eventually, we'll get them back. <laughs>